scripture text is coming from John chapter 7. We will pick up at verse 14 and read throughout verse 24. The word of God reads, chapter 7, the gospel according to John, verse 14. But when it was now the midst of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and began to teach. The Jews then were astonished, saying, How has this man become learned, having never been educated? So Jesus answered them and said, My teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. If anyone is willing to do his will, he will know of the teaching, whether it is of God or whether I speak from myself. He who speaks from himself seeks his own glory. For he who is speak, seeking the glory of the one who sent him, he is true, and there is no unrighteousness in him. Did not Moses give you the law, and yet none of you carries out the law? Why do you seek to kill me? The crowd answered, You have a demon who seeks to kill you. Jesus answered them, I did one deed, and you all marvel. For this reason, Moses has given you circumcision. Not because it is from Moses, but from the fathers. And on the Sabbath you would circumcise a man. If a man receives circumcision on the Sabbath so that the law of Moses will not be broken, you are angry with me because I made an entire man well on the Sabbath? Do not judge according to the appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. The word of God has been read in your hearing from the seventh chapter of the Gospel of the <coughs> Verses 14 through 24. May God truly add a blessing to the reading and hearing of His Word. Let us continue with our study. We're studying the fourth chapter of the Gospel. And we're currently in the seventh chapter. Before we continue with this paragraph, I would like for us to do a short review as we have seen what we have noticed and learned in the previous two chapters. If you recall, chapter number five is one of the greatest chapters in the Word of God dealing with the deity of Christ. In chapter 5, we saw Jesus heal a man on the Sabbath, and when accused by making himself equal with God, he launches into this monologue proclaiming that he is in fact equal to God in every way. Chapter 6, you remember, is one of the greatest chapters in the Word of God dealing with the subject of the sovereignty of God in salvation. Jesus over and over again tells unsaved men that unless God has given them to the Son, unless God draws them, they will never come to Him and never <clears throat> understand His words. Last week, if you remember, we looked at the first 13 verses of chapter number 7, which opens with the Jews seeking to kill Jesus. If you remember the geographical location of the opening verses of chapter 7, we found that we were still in Galilee. Jesus has been in Galilee for a whole year now, ministering, teaching, healing, and performing miracles. And the first 13 verses of chapter 7 describes the discussion about and the action of Jesus' return to Jerusalem. The events of chapter 7, if you remember, took place in the context of the Feast of Booths or the Feast of Tabernacles, as it is often called, that took place in Jerusalem. Because of the feast, Jerusalem is crowded. People from all over the area, Judea and all over Israel and Galilee, have come to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. The crowd is buzzing and talking. And they have many speculations about Jesus. And we found last week that the crowd was divided concerning his possible identity. Some were saying that he was simply a good man, and others were saying that he was a deceiver. We read that in verse 14, but when, but when it was now the midst of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and began to teach, verse 14 of our text. Notice that first phrase, but when it was now in the midst of the feast. This is most likely the third or the fourth day of the feast of the festival. 
We learned last week that this festival was one of three main feasts that every male in Israel was required to attend. This festival usually lasted seven days, and they usually had a sacred assembly on the eighth day, according to Leviticus 23 and Numbers 29. Remember, Jesus did not go up to the feast when everybody else did. Remember, that was a discussion last week his brothers had with him. He waited until the middle of the week because he knew something. He knew that the rulers wanted to kill him. Remember we read that in verse number 11, John chapter 7. So the Jews were seeking him at the feast and were saying, where is he? He knew what they wanted to do. So he stays behind. He lags behind. He waits. He waits until the middle of the feast and then he shows up. <coughs> And he begins to teach publicly. Some think that because of the controversy about his miracle that he performed on the Sabbath day recorded in the 7th chapter, verses 21 to 24, that he arrived at the feast on the Sabbath. That's possible. But we can't really be certain. But the text does say that he went up into the temple. <clears throat> the impression that we get is that of a sudden and surprising appearance of Jesus in the temple. He didn't come in the beginning. He didn't come when the feast started. But then suddenly he shows up. Now John the author here may have been trying to create that impression or maybe just to remind his readers of what Malachi chapter 3 verse 1 says. Malachi Old Testament chapter 3 1 says, Behold, I am going to send my messenger, and he will clear the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, and the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. That could have been what John was alluding to. Some strands of the Jewish expectation believed that the Messiah would just suddenly show up kind of out of the blue, so to speak. So John's description here of Jesus' sudden appearance would raise the question of Jesus' identity as to whether or not he is the true Messiah. I want you to take note of the Greek word that's used for the word temple here. And it indicates that this was indeed the outer court of the temple area. We tend to think of the temple as being one single building, but it was much more than that. The temple in Jerusalem, its most sacred spot, would be called the Holies of Holies, where only, if you remember, the high priest could enter. Next to that was the sanctuary, and it was only limited to the priest of that time. And then there was the court of Israel, where the laymen could gather. Following that was the court of women that was limited to Jewish women. Then there was the great court of the Gentiles. The court of the Gentiles, we are told, was a huge area, about three football fields long and about three football fields wide. It was meant to be a sacred place where only Gentiles from any nation could come into this court and they could pursue the God of the Hebrews, and then enter into some sort of experience with God. But our text once again says Jesus went up into the temple. Remember, if you can, what we saw in chapter 2, the tabernacle and the temple was a type. It was a type, but here Jesus is the anti-type. Jesus replaces the temple Itself, He is the temple. The temple, if you remember in the Old Testament, always represented the presence of God among God's children in the early days of their existence with God. So Jesus came and he pitched, pitched his tent, or we say he tabernacled among his people. So here we have Jesus, the true temple, the true presence of God, He's standing in the midst of this Jewish temple during this feast. And the text says he went up into the temple and began to teach. Now this wasn't unusual 
This is what rabbis do. Rabbis would go into the temple, and particularly the temple courtyard, which was this massive area, and they would simply find a location in the courtyard, and they would start a school. So Jesus found a place in the courtyard, and he simply began to do what he knew, which is to teach. Now, the question comes to my mind is, what do you think he was teaching about? Well, I have to go back to the Jewish culture of Jesus' day. The function of a teacher was simply to teach and explain the law of Moses. In fact, in Jesus' time, there was no other curriculum to be taught. Elementary school for the, for the little boys consisted of teaching these young men to read and to memorize the law of Moses. Graduate school consisted of training the rabbis on learning and memorizing the oral tradition that the Jews believed to have been delivered to Moses and passed along orally through the centuries. This to me suggests that when Jesus was teaching in the temple, he was giving them interpretations of the Torah. Notice verse 15 in our text, if you will. The Jews then were astonished, saying, How has this man become learned, having never been educated? The phrase, the Jews then were astonished. I think John uses the word Jews here as the Jewish leaders. As we have made note of that several occasions when we read about the Jews, he's talking about the leadership of the Jews. Notice their response to Jesus' teaching. The text says they were astonished. This word is a particular word in the Greek language, and it characteristically is used when the object of perception has an extremely unusual, profound effect. We see this word used several times in the New Testament, which adds to this idea. For instance, it's the word used of the disciples after Jesus had calmed the, the storm. If you recall, according to Matthew's rendition in Matthew chapter 8, verse 26 and 27, he said to them, Why are you afraid, you men of little faith? Then he got up and rebuked the winds and the sea, and it became perfectly calm. The men were, here's our word, amazed and said, what kind of man is this that even the winds and the sea obey him? That word amazed in that text is our word in our particular text this morning. They had seen the power of God right before their eyes, this unusual phenomenon, and they were astonished, they were amazed. We also see the same word used in Acts chapter 4, verse 13, where the word of God reads, Now as they observed the confidence of Peter and John, and understood that they, Peter and John, were uneducated and untrained men, they were marveling and began to recognize them as having been with Jesus. The wisdom of Peter caused this Sanhedrin court in this text to marvel. Here's our word, marvel. They were astonished. They were amazed. The Sanhedrin were quite impressed. They were used to men cringing before them. They were not used to men speaking out boldly. And they were not used to having the scriptures quoted back at them and then having the scriptures explained to them. And these Jewish rulers were at a loss to understand what was happening. How could these uneducated common men, these fishermen from Galilee, have such poise and confidence? And the, and the conclusion that they came to is most remarkable. Their own expectation was that these men simply had been with Jesus. Amen. That they had been with the most poised of all men. That they had been with the most confident of all men. Remember the word about Jesus was he spoke like no other man had ever spoken. Amen. So here you have his, his disciples speaking with such poise and confidence which only leads to one conclusion. They must have been with Jesus. Amen. So these Jewish leaders were astonished at Jesus' teaching and at the teaching of his disciples. 
these Jews who wanted to kill Jesus are here unwittingly praising him. They are marveling at how Jesus, who has not been educated by any of them, has now had such keen understanding of the scriptures. He uses this phrase in the text, this man, this man. It has a connotation of disrespect. It has a connotation of talking down about someone. We see the same word used in John chapter 18, verse 17. That's John chapter 18, verse 17. You remember on the night that Jesus was being crucified and the disciples were all running scared. And Peter finds himself in the courtyard. And the text says, then the slave girl who kept the door said to Peter, you are not also one of these man's disciples, are you? And Peter said, I am not. So they marveled that this man, a term of disrespect, who has no education, can teach the way he does. The term in our text, he became learned, is also from another Greek word which literally means he knows his stuff. He knows the letters. He knows the stuff. And used it refers to scriptural or spiritual writings. It is also used in chapter number 5, verses 46 and 47, where we read, For if you believe Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you then believe my words? Moses' writings were the scriptures for those in Jesus' day. So when they ask, how does this man know letters, or how does this man know the law, or how does this man know the book, they were asking, how does he know the scriptures when he has not sat at the feet of any of us rabbis? In modern language, this would be, how is he able to teach and understand the truth of God so well when he doesn't have a degree from any of our accredited institutions. The Jews had the idea that teaching could come only from two sources. It either could come from one of their schools, and so they would ask, what rabbi has he studied under? Or it could come from oneself. But there was another alternative, and they had no idea who that other alternative was. That the teaching had come directly from God himself. So we find Jesus responding in our text in verse number 16, if you're keeping up with me. So Jesus answered them and he said, my teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. Notice the phrase, my teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. Since the rabbis often sent a student with power of attorney. Jesus' reply makes perfect sense in a Jewish context. In order to give authority to what they said, they would rather quote another respected rabbi. This validated what they said so that people wouldn't think that they had invented it. And in keeping up with tradition, that's not what Jesus did. He didn't go around quoting other rabbis. Right. He didn't go around quoting what other folks said. He simply quoted what God the Father said. Right. He quoted Yahweh. He quoted his Father. What he is saying here is, I have not made up this teaching. It is the teaching of my Father. If you hear what I'm saying, you are hearing what my Father is saying. This was a claim that he made over and over and over and over again. Notice what he says in John chapter 5 and verse 19. That's John 5 and 19. Therefore, Jesus answered and saying to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself unless it is something he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does these things, the Son also does in like manner. In other words, everything that Jesus did had to come from the Father. Everything that Jesus said came from the Father. 
if Jesus was raising the dead, the Father was raising the dead. If Jesus was feeding the multitude, the Father was feeding the multitude. Amen. He would go on to say in that fifth chapter, verse number 30, I simply can do nothing on my own initiative. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just. Why? Because I do not seek my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Amen. Jesus claimed that everything that he does came from the Father. There have been many teachers who have come down through the centuries who have argued that they were saying precisely what God has said. And that they therefore should be heard and that they therefore should be obeyed. So what gave Jesus the right to say then what he did? You remember what Nicodemus said. Nicodemus said in John 3 and verse 2, John 3 and verse 2, this man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher. For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. The miracles himself gave proof to his claims. They had seen him give a lame man the ability to walk. They had seen him try up an issue of blood with a woman. They had seen the dead rise in their sight. But notice what Jesus says about how men will know that he is from God and teachings that what God has sent him. Notice what he says in our text, John chapter 7 and verse 17. He says, if anyone is willing to do his will, he will know of the teaching, whether it is of God or whether I speak from myself. Now what is Jesus saying here? How will a man know if Jesus' teaching is from God or from himself? He says, if anyone, get this, follow me closely, pay attention. If anyone is willing to do his will, notice the if clause. If, if, this is a conditional sentence. And it denotes potential or possible action. The King James Version quotes this verse and simply said, if any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. Now this verse in itself almost sounds as if a man goes out and does his will, then after having done his will, he will come to know of the doctrine. And many will see as to what kind of man he is. I want to quote a little passage from John MacArthur as he commentates on this particular verse relating to our text. John MacArthur says, what draws people to the gospel, what draws people to Christ is a desire to do the will of God. You come to know the truth when God reveals the truth to you. And he reveals it to you only when you seek to do his will. So you have to seek God and then he reveals his will to you. He goes on to say, you turn, and then it becomes known to you. Repentance comes first. God does not grant light on the truth unless a person or man is anxious to walk according to that light. Now that is contrary to the great Danish philosopher, Killingard. Killingard, the great Danish philosopher, he says, it is difficult for us to believe because it's difficult to obey. And to this, many commentators add, if you're willing to obey, God will show you that Jesus is God's true and righteous one. He is the worthy one that you must trust. That's using the, the common sense that people come to. That's using the common conclusion that people come to from this verse. If you are willing to obey, God will show you that Jesus is God's true and righteous one. He is worthy of all your trust. So they seem to be asking, or they seem to be saying this, if a man goes out and does God's will, then after having done his will, he will come then to know the doctrine. If you can follow the progression, he goes out and does his will, and then after having done his will, he will come to know his doctrine. Now, that is not what the Lord is saying here. I don't believe this is what Jesus is saying here. He's not saying that one must go do some ethical work, and then having done some ethical work, then God will then introduce him to the knowledge of the truth. 
No, that's not what he means here. I like the way the ESV puts it. The ESV puts it translated, if anyone wills is to do God's will. If anyone wills to do God's will. The stress here in the NSV is on the person's will, not on the person doing. It's the person's will. If you will to do God's will, then you will know that Jesus' teaching is from God. Whose will is to do God's will? If you have been paying attention to our study of this gospel at all, you will know that it is impossible for anyone to do God's will apart from God's precious, glorious, powerful work through the Holy Spirit. God must make a man willing by a sovereign act of grace. Man can't by himself come to the conclusion that he's going to do God's will unless God intervene and does a work of grace within the life of that individual. Men will not come to that conclusion. A free human decision about the claims of God is impossible. A free human decision about the claims of Jesus is impossible. Why do you believe that's true, Pastor? Well, because Jesus said, no man can come to me unless he is drawn by the Father. One must be given to Jesus by the Father. You have to be given to Jesus by the Father. If the Father don't give you to Jesus, you never come to Jesus. You can't come to Jesus on your own. You can't make up your mind you're going to come to Jesus when you want to. He has to be a gift to you from the Father. He has to be. That's what our Lord means when he said that if any man wills to do his will. He's talking about the work of faith which is something produced in me and only by the work of God. Faith is a product of what God works in you. Unless God has worked in you, you never come to having faith. God is the one who gives you the faith to believe that Jesus is the Christ. Amen. Now let me just add here that I think that a believer can learn more about God when they live in obedience. I think sin, I think sin hinders our understanding of what to learn. Say it again, Pastor. That went over somebody's head. <laughs> I believe that a believer can learn a whole lot about God when they live in a life of obedience. Amen. But I believe sin hinders you understanding what it is you have come into knowledge about. But that's not true of a lost person. That's not true of an unbeliever. An unbeliever is simply dead, blind, living in darkness. No capability of understanding what God's word said. They cannot understand nor can they accept the things of the spirit. <clears throat> so Jesus will go on to say in verse 18 of our text, He who speaks from himself seeks his own glory. But he who is seeking the glory of the one who sent him, he is true. And there is no unrighteousness in him. Jesus now, Jesus now makes a point of attack on these Jewish religious leaders, these rabbis, who saw their ministry as an opportunity to build their own fame, to put their name in light. Here Jesus returned to the theme of John chapter 5, verse 41 through 44. If you remember, in, in teaching on that chapter, Jesus speaking to those Jewish leaders, he said in verse 44 of John chapter 5, How can you believe when you receive glory from one another? And you do not seek the glory that is from the one and only God. You see, the truth of their loving to receive glory from one another is found in the fact that they got their respect or their accolades from other people. Matthew picked up on this in Matthew chapter 23, verse 6 and 7. Matthew said they love the place of honor at banquets and the chief seats in the synagogue and respectful greetings in the marketplaces and being called rabbi by men. They love being noticed. They love the attention that came with being known to be a rabbi. They got the choice seats. They got respect. They got honor. They love that coming from men. Paul taught us that a true Jew 
A true Jew who was one that was circumcised in the heart is one who praise is not from men, but whose praise comes from God. Romans chapter 2 and verse 29. But the individuals in our text this morning wanted praise coming from men. I think that the second glory that's found in uh, uh, John 5 and 44 refers to Christ, the glory of God. Jesus is the glory of God. By shifting from the first reference to himself to the third person, Jesus makes a point of attack on these Jewish rabbis who saw their ministry as an opportunity to build their own fame. In contrast, Jesus pursued the glory of the Father who sent him. The text said he is true. He is true. The other the only other time in the gospel where a person is said to be true is only referring to God. John chapter 3, verse 33, he who has received his testimony has set his seal to this, that God is true. Jesus wants us to see that he alone shares this quality with God the Father. The person who advances the idea of another ends up glorifying the other person rather than himself or herself. Jesus claimed to do the latter and to desire the glory of the one who sent him, whereas his opponents, these Jewish religious leaders, sought their own glory. Verse 19 of John chapter 7, Did not Moses give you the law? And yet none of you carries out the law? Why do you seek to kill me? Now I want you to follow me here. Jesus is not talking all over the place. He's really teaching pointed and he's really talking about one subject. When you look at how the sentence is set up, the grammatical construction here is a rhetorical question. The only answer that one can give to this question is yes. Moses did give you the law, but Jesus is saying you don't live by the law. The law of Moses said, according to Exodus 20 and 13, you shall not let murder. But Jesus knew their attempts. Their attempts were to execute him. Their attempts was to kill or to murder an innocent man. It is nothing less than attempted murder, an effort to break this law. And he's speaking to the Jews about this point. They know exactly what he's talking about. He asked them, why do you seek to kill me? Why did these Jewish authorities begin to discuss killing Jesus? They began to speak of killing Jesus. You have to remember back in John chapter 5 at the feast when Jesus healed the man on the Sabbath and then said that he and his father was one. And then he went on to teach that he was equal to the Father in every way. They sought to kill him from that time on. From that moment on in chapter 5, the healing of that man on the Sabbath day and Jesus making himself equal with God. They sought to kill him from that time on. But even in our text, verse 20 of John chapter 7, notice how the crowd responds. Notice how the crowd responds. I hope you're reading the Bible with me. The crowd responds, you have a demon who seeks to kill you. Who have a demon who seeks to kill you. Who said this? The crowd. Many of this crowd would be those pilgrims who have come to Jerusalem or to or some other distant place to celebrate this festival. They were not aware of the Jewish leaders plot to kill Jesus. So they thought that he was crazy to think that someone was out there trying to kill him. The Jews of Jesus' day commonly thought of mental illness in the case of paranoia as being demon-induced or demon-filled. These people were not charging Jesus with getting his power from Satan. They were simply saying that he was crazy. They were simply saying that he was out of his mind talking about somebody to kill him and they were not aware of what these Jewish leaders were trying to do behind the scene. So they're saying, you're possessed. You're crazy. But Jesus answered them, the crowd, and Jesus said, I did one deed and you all marveled. Verse 21. That word marvel is characteristically used of an, of an object of perception with extremely unusual potential power. What did Jesus do that caused them to marvel? 
He was accused, remember, we had spoken of this several times in our text today. He had been accused of breaking the law of Moses by working on the Sabbath. Why? Because he had healed the lame man on the Sabbath, a man who has paralyzed for 38 years. They weren't marveling because he healed the man. They marveled because he did it on the Sabbath. John chapter 5, verse 16 and 17 reads like this. For this reason the Jews were persecuting him because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But he answered them, my father is working until now, and I myself am working. Jesus defends his actions by pointing out that he is merely, merely doing what his father is doing. If his father is working on the Sabbath, he works on the Sabbath. The rabbis regarded God as working on the Sabbath by simply maintaining the universe. Of course God works on the Sabbath because God is the one who keeps the sun in place. Of course God works on the Sabbath because God is the one who hangs the star. God is the one who keeps the universe situated. Of course God works. God keeps everything balanced. Yes, he does. But they didn't know that Jesus was God and that his intimate relationship with God the Father. So if God is keeping the universe in balance, Jesus got to be doing something. As the Father works, so did the Son. So did the Son. He said, my Father is constantly at work. My Father is at work until now. He's making this claim that what the Father is doing, that's what he's doing. I, myself, the words that he used, am working. He's describing his work. He's describing his independence of God and his interdependence with God. He is working as his father worked. God did not suspend his activities simply because it was the Sabbath. God didn't stop the sun from shining simply because it was the Sabbath. God didn't throw up the moon at night simply because it was the Sabbath. God, God didn't let go of the universe simply because it was the Sabbath. If it was the Sabbath, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and whatever day it was, if it was necessary for the sun to hang and shine his light, God kept it up there. Jesus said, it don't matter what the day is with God. Because they had totally misunderstood what the Sabbath was all about. This was once again a claim of Jesus' deity. He's claiming his deity. He's trying to prove what John's major goal is in his text. Our next verse, verse 22. Stay with me, stay with me, stay with me. For this reason, he says, Moses has given you circumcision. Not because it's from Moses, but from the fathers. And on the Sabbath, he says, you circumcise a man. I hope you can keep with the reasoning here with Jesus. Jesus is such a profound teacher to me. And he is didactically tearing apart their argument. He is didactically putting in front of them all of their false information. He's laying out his case before them. He's going to shut their mouth. They have nothing to say to him. He says, for this reason, Moses has given you circumcision. Not because it is from Moses, but from the fathers. And on the Sabbath, you circumcise a man. We understand that circumcision is a sign of the Abrahamic covenant as given to us in Genesis chapter 17, verses 10 through 14. And it was later concluded, and it was later included rather in the Moses co covenant with God and the people. Leviticus chapter 12 and verse 3. Circumcision was the believed to be the healing of the newborn by bringing him out of the world and into a sacred covenant with God. According to the traditions, the command to circumcise newborn boys on the eighth day overrides the duty to observe the Sabbath rest to remain from work until it falls on the same day. Jesus' argument then is that if it is lawful to heal part of the body on the Sabbath, how then is it unlawful to heal the whole body when the need arises on the Sabbath? He's using a typical first century argument with these rabbis. In Jesus' day, there were seven schools of the Pharisees. There were seven schools of the Pharisees. And all seven of the schools took the Bible literally, or took the Torah literally. But they ranged from the being the most progressive school, which was called the school of Hillel, 
to the most conservative, very traditional school, which was called the school of Shema. And then the other five schools whose views fell between Hillel and Shema. These rabbinical schools were always arguing back and forth about how to interpret the Torah or to, to determine what would be the proper yoke to put on the people. The rabbis with the Shema had their own way of coming up with a new teaching. And that method of interpretation was called their particular yoke. The yoke of the Torah is the way you take the burden of keeping the Torah on your shoulders. You do it according to the Hillel method or the Shema method. Every rabbi had a different yoke. Every rabbi had a different spin. The Torah teachers would teach the accepted interpretation or their particular yoke to their particular community. And if you wanted to know what a rabbi yoke was, you would go to their school and listen and learn their interpretation of the law. But if you remember the greatest commandment, we'll tell you what the yoke is. As Jesus told us in Matthew chapter 22 and verse 36 through verse 40. That's Matthew chapter 22 verse 36 through verse 40. Here the rabbi Jesus Teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the law? Verse 37, and he, the teacher, Rabbi Jesus, he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. Verse 38, this is the greatest and foremost commandment. Verse 39, the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Verse 40, on these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. The Jews said that the commandments contradict each other by God's design. So they had to know which was greater. Let me give you an example. I like to flesh this stuff out. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. Over in the Old Testament, Exodus chapter 31, verse 14 and 15. You don't mind if I go there, do you? Okay. Well, whether you mind or not, I'm going. <laughs> so if you're on my train, you're going to travel with me. I got a few more minutes. Amen. Let's explore this, brother the man. Over here in Exodus chapter 31, verse 14 and 15. He says, therefore, you are to observe the Sabbath, for it is holy to you. Everyone who profanes it shall surely be put to death. For whoever does any work on it, that person shall be cut off from among his people. For six days work must be done, but on the seventh day there is a Sabbath of complete rest, holy to the Lord. Whoever does any work on the Sabbath day shall surely be put to to death. Now I believe that's clear enough. Send the instructions to these children of Israel that they are not to work on the Sabbath. The Torah also taught according to Leviticus chapter 12. That's Leviticus beginning with the letter L chapter 12 verses 1 through 3. Also a part of the Torah. Leviticus 12, verses 1 to 3. The word of God reads, Then the word in the Lord spoke to Moses. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel, saying, When a woman gives birth and bears a male child, then she shall be unclean for seven days, as in the days of her menstruation shall she be unclean. On the eighth day, the flesh of his foreskin shall be circumcised. Now, what is that text teaching us? They were to circumcise a male child on the eighth day. That's clear also, right? Yes. Both of those texts are clear. Yes. But what do they do if the eighth day falls on the Sabbath? How do they keep one command without breaking the other? Oh, man. This is why they were always asking which is the greatest commandment. The greater one is the one that they thought that they must keep. With having 613 individual laws are given to the Torah 
from which are they to choose? All seven of the schools of the Pharisees agreed on the greatest commandment was simply to love God. And when asked, Jesus, the great rabbi, when he's asked what is the greatest commandment, the Shemal school would answer, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. The Hallel school would answer the same. And so was Jesus' answer. But where did Jesus' answer come from? Jesus said this from Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4 and 5. Oh, I wish y'all know the Shema, the, the, the Shema law, the Shema word, some of you all know it. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with what? All your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. But what did the Jews call this passage? They call this the Shema, which literally means hear. And based on the verbal interpretation at the start of this verse, a careful investigation here clearly suggests that Deuteronomy 6 and 4 must have been the four first portion from which the Torah that Jesus had committed to memory. According to the Babylonian uh, Talmud, Jewish boys were taught this biblical passage as soon as they began to speak. So all the rabbinical schools of Jesus' day agreed upon the greatest commandment. And so when asked, what then is the second commandment? The Shemal school would answer simply, keep the Sabbath. They put the Sabbath law above all others because they said that the Sabbath was about God. When asked, what is the second commandment? The Hillel school would answer simply to love your neighbor. Jesus' answer was also to love your neighbor. Love your neighbor comes seventh in the Shema school. The debate in Jesus' day was then how then does one interpret the Torah by deciding what is the greater or lesser commandment? We see this idea of the greater and lesser commandments in Jesus' words in Matthew chapter 5, verse 19. Now don't get tired of what I'm going here now. Mm -hmm. Whatever Jesus said in Matthew 5 and 19, whoever then knows one of the least of these commandments and so teaches others, shall be called least in the kingdom of God. But whoever keeps and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. The Jews of Jesus' day allowed for a male child to be circumcised on the Sabbath. Why do they do it on the Sabbath? Because it's hard to be done on the day other than what the scriptures had said. If the scriptures said do it on the eighth day, they don't do it on the Sabbath. Don't do it on the ninth. Do it on the eighth day. And so when the eighth day happened to be on the Sabbath, they did it on the eighth day. So in a sense, they violated their own tradition according to the working on the Sabbath, according to their interpretation to the letter of the law. So if necessary, the Sabbath could be set aside for something that they thought was important, but something lesser, it had to be brought back into view. All right. mm. The 23rd verse of John chapter 7 says, if a man receives circumcision on the Sabbath so that the law of Moses will not be broken, are you angry with me because I made an entire man well mm. on the Sabbath? Once again, that word if is bringing in the if clause here in this verse. Mm -hmm. That if clause which assumes to be true from the writer's perspective. Jesus' argument is an excellent example of the Jewish method of arguing from a lesser matter to a greater matter. The essence of Jesus' argument was that they were willing to put aside their sabbatical rules so that a baby could be circumcised, but were unwilling to put aside their sabbatical rules that a man might be made whole. The rabbis counted 248 parts in a man's body. And according to the Talmud, if circumcision, which attacks only one of the 248 members of the whole human body, suspends or comes on the Sabbath, how much more then should the saving of the other 247 parts of the body weigh? So absolutely binding to this rabbinical tradition, the commandments according to Leviticus chapter 12 and verse 3 to circumcise, on the eighth day, Jesus did not violate that. Mm 
Jesus brought in the whole context of making the whole man well. So Jesus basically said, I'm not breaking the law. They were accusing him of breaking the law. He said, I'm not doing anything different than what you do on a regular basis. And he concludes his defense in his argument, he says in that 24th fourth verse of our text this morning, do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. Don't judge according to what you see me doing. You got to understand the what, when, where, and how I'm coming from. Jesus concluded by warning his hearers against judging according to appearance, according superficially, their superficial judgment about what was legally correct or true was only according to their interpretation of what they thought was God's law. Sabbath had resulted in a superficial judgment about Jesus' work and Jesus' person. They were judging Jesus because he healed a man and then told him to carry his mat on the Sabbath, which was, according to them, a violation of their legalistical additions to the Sabbath commandment. But at the same time, they were rejecting the true and righteous one, and they were seeking to kill him. And by judging by appearance, they saw Jesus as just a man. That's because Jesus was indistinguishable from any other Gentile man. He looked like a Gentile man. He walked like a Gentile man. He wore a Gentile clothes. But because they had no interconnection with him, they did not know of his deity. They saw him from the outside. They only judged from what was visible. They only judged from his humanity. So instead of believing his words, that's where the spirit of life was. They judged him simply as a man. They did not believe in his word. If they had believed in his word, they would have saw him for who he really was. Because his life and his power and his true existence was in his word, not in his physical quality. Now this is a great verse. I believe for all of us to take heed of. How often do we judge according to appearance? When we judge, our judgment is to be righteous. We need to have a judgment that's not superficial. Our judgment should always be based upon truth of scripture. Our judgment should not be based upon our feelings and our individual prejudices. Our judgment should be based upon the word of God. The word of God. The word of God. And if we don't know the word of God, we can't judge rightly the word of God. We can't call something what it shouldn't be if we don't know the word of God. I encourage you people of God this morning as we're living in difficult and trying times and every day bring something new on the scene. I, I suggest to you, I encourage you, I implore you, I beseech you as Paul would say to get into the word of God. And as Jesus said, to let not your heart be troubled and judge not according to what you see, but according to what the word is saying. The word is saying that in these days, careless times will come. And we are in careless times. We are in dangerous times. But as Jesus used the argument of the Jews to twist them up and to show them that they were breaking their own law, we must be secure in the word of God and not let the things of these days bring us to a period of anxiousness and worry. Amen. 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 Get into the Word of God. Yes. 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 Allow the Word of God to settle all matters. Yes. Yes. Okay. Let the church say amen. 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 Get your outlines. Get your outlines. Let's fill in your outlines. Amen. Amen. I preach to you the unadulterated truth of God's Word today. Yes. And then explain it to you the best way that I can. Amen. Here amen. is your outline. You have several points here in your outline. Thank you, Point number one is simply. Jesus is the true and the righteous one. Mm -hmm. He is the true and the righteous one. He is the true and the righteous one. The true and the righteous one. From verses 19 to 23, he gives us four points to point this out. Letter A is simply this. Letter A, Jesus is true and righteous. Why? Because he was sent here from God. God sent him. He came on orders directly from God. And we saw that in verse 16 and 18. Letter B, letter B, Jesus is true and righteous because he taught God's truth. He taught him God's truth. That's what verse 14 through 17 taught us. Jesus is true and righteous because he was sent from God. Jesus is true and righteous because he taught God's truth. Letter C, Jesus is true and righteous because he sought God's glory. 
He sought God's glory. He didn't seek his own glory. He sought God's glory. He sought to put God on display. And then let her be. Jesus is true and righteous because he did God's miraculous works. He did God's miraculous works. Jesus is true and righteous because he was sent here from God. Jesus is true and righteous because he taught God's truth. Jesus is true and righteous because he sought God's glory. And then Jesus is true and righteous because he did God's marvelous works. Here's point number two. Point number two. Point number two. People today reject Jesus in spite of who he is because of their many sins. The question is, with God showing himself through nature and without, without, with God manifesting himself to the conscience of men, why do people yet reject Jesus as being Lord and Savior? They reject him because of their many, many sins. Their sins keep them from knowing who Jesus really is. Two points to support that particular point here in letter A. People reject Jesus in spite of who he is because they value the wrong thing. They value the wrong things. They value the wrong things. I'm here to admonish and encourage the saints. The most valuable thing to us should be our relationship with God. The most valuable and the most precious thing to us as believers should be our ability to communicate with Him, to talk with Him, to pray with Him. Our most valuable relationship should be the relationship that we have with God through His Son, Jesus. Yes. Our most greatest yes. encounter should be with that of the Holy Spirit, which magnifies to us the ministry of Jesus. Oh, through the Word of God, we should value every aspect of the things of God. We should value our ability to come together and sing together, to pray together, to get into Scripture and study the Scripture together. We should value the Christian community. We should value having to pray with one another and for one another. That should be number one on our list. That should be one on number one, one on our list. But for many in the Christian faith, they do not value the things of God. They value the things of the world. They value the things of this world. And then let it be. People reject Jesus in spite of who he is because they're not willing to obey him. They're not willing to obey him. I hope none of you in today's audience fall in that category. I pray that all of us are willing to obey him at any cost. Willing to obey Jesus. Willing to obey Jesus. As you read the word of God and God reveals where you are. As you read and study God's word and God reveals where you are, what needs to go, what needs to become here. And as God begins to correct some of our thinking and some of our talking, I pray that we'll be willing to obey him. People reject Jesus. They reject Jesus because of sin. Today, John chapter 7, verses 14 to 24 has been presented to you. I pray that the reading and teaching and expounding on God's word, I yet have one more point. Two more points. We'll get them, put them on up here. Let's go. Oh, my thing. I'm through here to let see. People reject Jesus in spite of who he is because they are legalistic hypocrites. Legalistic hypocrites. Legalistic hypocrites. They want you to operate by some rule. They want you to operate by some rule that they think is the only way to get to heaven. And not understanding what Jesus' total law is. And people reject Jesus, let it be in spite of who he is because they are under satanic influence. They are under the influence of Satan himself. I pray that none of us in this room is operating in any of these, in any of these categories. And Jesus attacked, Jesus argued, Jesus defended himself against these Jewish, these religious Jews. And these were the points he brought out in today's lesson. Today's text of John chapter 7, verse 14 to 24, as been presented in your hearing today, I pray that the Spirit of God will make them alive in you as you take these words and as you study the Word of God, as you ponder over what God has said to us in the Word, read it, pray over it, and allow God to speak to your heart regarding what God is teaching us in this Word. Bow your heads with me in prayer. Bow your heads with me in prayer. Father, we are honored this morning to have been able to come together collectively yes. as a body of believers. We have been able to pray, sing, share, minister one to another. We have been able to engage even in the scriptures today. 
God, we thank you for living in a country where we have the right and the ability to come to a place and gather together without any threat of a government trying to disband us and trying to keep us from worshiping God as we see fit. So we thank you for this liberty. And I thank you this morning for each and every one who have gathered themselves in this room <clears throat> under whatever distress, under whatever temptation, under whatever obligation they had, God. The choice was made to come this way, to park in this parking lot, to come in this room and to sit and listen and hear and engage in your scriptures. Lord God, I know there's power in your scriptures. I pray, Lord God, that we will read your scriptures. We will engage ourselves in scripture. We will read over this passage of scripture and understand Jesus' argument with these religious Jews. But understand that Jesus was more willing to do the will of his Father than try to please a human man. God, I pray that we too will be seeking to please God our Father through your words, Jesus, rather than pleasing ourselves, pleasing the world, the flesh, and the devil, and other folks. God, may we be a people that's situated and, and situated firmly in the Word of God. May the Word of God be the rule of thumb in our homes, on our jobs. May we govern our behavior by what the Word of God said. May we hunger and thirst to please you through the Word of God. May we pray the Word of God, sing the Word of God, speak the Word of God. May the Word of God be our anchor. God, you know what we're going to be facing this week. You know, you know every hill, every valley, every high and every low. You know what's going to disturb us and you know what's going to bring a smile on our face. I pray, Holy Spirit, you, you will go before us and prepare the way for us. And I pray that each and every day we will seek your will. We will seek to honor you. And God, may we follow you in the path that you lay out before us. Continue to bless us as a congregation. Bless us as a congregation. Honor us with the presence of your spirit. Continue to give us teaching in your word of God. Give us understanding in your word of God. You make it applicable to us. You bring it to our hearts, Lord God. Make us to be a church, a lover of your word. May we be lovers of one another, Lord God. May we seek to help one another as never before. Meet the needs of one another. Praying for one another. Lifting one another in prayer, Lord God. Those on our prayer list and those that we don't know not what's happening, God. But as you place them in our hearts. Oh, God, touch each and every one of our families. All of us is going through something. God, touch our children. Bring our children, Lord God, who have been brought up in the way, who know of the way. Bring them, Lord God, to an understanding of who you are. Open up their eyes and they can see their greatest needs. May we never cease to pray and believe, God, that you will do what you said, that you will do what you promised. God, you are the healer. You are the healer. Bring your healing in whatever way you seem to manifest, Lord God, in this congregation as we have sick. And we have those who are yet going through. But you're the God who heals and comforts. And so God, we simply look to you today. You are our priority and we value you. Do what you do best, the impossible. God, may we as a church ever lift up the standard. May we as a church ever lift up your name. May we not be ashamed of who you are. May we not be ashamed to be called Christians. We thank you for this. Thank you. And for your word. Let the church say amen. Amen.